Good morning. Um, it's been a busy week in Lake Wobegon. Um, this uh, study was um, presented on Wednesday in College Park at the Purple Line Summit, which Ike Leggett and Rashern Baker organized to promote business community efforts to recognize what an enormous shot in the arm the Purple Line will be for our regional economy. And um, you can look through the slides at your leisure, but I think the, the bottom line is on page 13 where it's titled Conclusions. I'm just going to read the bullets here. This was a firm that um, in Frederick, uh, it's called Thames, that did an econometric analysis. The productivity benefits create 27,000 jobs per year raises income by $1.8 billion per year and increases property value by $8.4 billion. The extra tax generated by the project is $10 billion, which is a six-fold return on the contributions from federal, state, and local government. Construction impacts are 18,380 person years of work, $156 million per year in extra income, and a $5.6 billion increase in regional domestic product. These figures were derived in 2010. Uh, the firm is going to do an update of these numbers soon, probably early spring. Um, so we're going to continue to make this case and monitor this point. But if, as Governor Hogan says, and we agree, you want to create jobs and grow our tax base and strengthen our economy, the nearest term decision facing this part of Maryland is whether to proceed with the Purple Line. And the numbers are overwhelmingly positive if we proceed with the Purple Line. It is the best thing we can do to strengthen our economy and grow our tax base. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. I thought that the meeting Wednesday uh, was very successful. We're going to be doing some follow-up. I appreciated the participation of Jim Dinegar, the president of the Board of Trade uh, of Greater Washington, and I'll be strategizing with him. And I've been on the phone with him uh, identifying other business leaders who can carry this message directly to Governor Hogan. Obviously, the governor gave a speech last week that was um, not so well received. I, I like the governor, and we all want to work with the governor. I do not think there is a mass exodus of Marylanders leaving the state. I don't see any evidence of it. I didn't see evidence of it when I was driving to work today in heavy traffic. I didn't see any evidence of it over the weekend when I was shopping in the Kentlands, where affluent Marylanders were engaging in commerce and going shopping and dining out. Um, it's funny to me because, you know, as an elected official, uh, naturally my constituents complain. You know, maybe two-thirds of the contacts I have with my constituents are to complain. So of maybe one-third of people saying, I love it here, everything's terrific, keep up the good work, maybe less than a third. Um, so I hear all the time that this place is too crowded, there's too many people here, housing prices are too high, and then we get this speech last night from the governor saying there's a mass exodus of Marylanders leaving. To my eye, I, I'm not seeing the mass exodus. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, that we will be able to work with the governor to strengthen our economy and proceed uh, with the projects that are so important to us. Um, as a longtime local office holder, uh, the, the functions that constituents ask us about the most are education and transportation. And if you want to have a healthy economy and grow our tax base, you've got to maintain terrific education system and improve our transportation network. And if we do those things, working with Governor Hogan, then Maryland has a bright future and um, we can stem this non-existent exodus of taxpayers, which um, I don't think is occurring. I do think that capital is mobile. So, you know, we all have examples of folks leaving the state and we have other examples of folks moving into the state. But I dispute the idea that there's a mass exodus. I don't see evidence of that. So um, I do also think that um, it's healthy, as I've said before, to have a dialogue about the size and scope and cost of government. So I think that uh, the governor's shining a bright light on our relative tax burden is probably a healthy thing. And I think it'll be healthy for us here in the county as we take up our own budget. I do think that the governor is striking a responsive chord with taxpayers, and that's all to the good. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that taxpayers are getting their money's worth for the taxes that they pay. We do have relatively high taxes in Maryland. I was doing a lot of um, online reading over the weekend, and there was a survey that had us as the 11th highest uh, tax state. So we're not in the top 10, <laughs> but you know you don't want to be um, as high as that. On the other hand, uh, several surveys had us with the very best schools. So there is a direct connection there. People do need to understand that um, our taxes are, I admit, in the state of Maryland and in Montgomery County, relatively high, and we have the best schools. So you know you get what you pay for. Um, in any event, I'll yield now and uh, find out what's on your minds. 
We also talked about change. We've had a change at the Board of Education. Tomorrow they're supposed to vote on a contract for a new superintendent. Do you have concerns there? I, I, um, <laughs> it's risky to spend so much time online, obviously, because you know there's different facts that compete with other facts, but um, the compensation that has been paid to the last two superintendents is more than two standard deviations from the mean in the distribution of school superintendent salaries that I found online recently. I think it is um, a highly desirable job, and I think that skilled, capable, ambitious people will apply for the job. When this superintendent um, made his decision uh, to leave, that story appeared on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, that's significant. The, this is a position of high visibility, and superintendents are strivers. They're ambitious. They're capable people. And to be here in the Washington, D.C. region in one of the most prestigious school systems in the United States is a great opportunity, and I'm very confident that superbly qualified people will be interested in the job. They're also voting tomorrow on the school bail times proposal. Do you have any thoughts on that? I support later bail times. I'm a high school parent. You talk about that anymore. What, what, what is it you see that, they, that, that, that is needed? Why, why should it be later? Uh, because I have read um, uh, reports from uh, pediatricians who suggest that teenagers are of an age where um, they find it very difficult to focus if they don't get sufficient sleep, and um, getting up very early in the morning interferes with their ability to concentrate during the day. Costs seem to be a big issue with that, though. Well, costs are an issue, and they're they're looking at different options. I mean, I I appreciate that they're taking the issue seriously, um, and you know, I, I think. My own view on high school bell times is the later the better. How about the many teachers? Apparently, they took a survey, the union saying that they oppose later start times. I think the teachers union is out of step with the public on that. I, I think the teachers union is certainly out of step with high school parents on that. Back to the purple line. Uh, after the speech the governor gave last week, um, and, and within that speech, he talked about wanting to get rid of indexing on the gas tax. And Speaker Powell said if that happens, the mass transit projects are dead. Um, I've spoken to several members of the General Assembly since the governor gave his speech on Wednesday, and I think the proposal to repeal indexing of the gas tax is dead on arrival. Are you encouraged that since uh, the governor gave his speech, he's apparently met with the leaders of the House and Senate, or is scheduled to, I think, um, to kind of smooth the waters? There were promises of bipartisanship. That speech really seemed to blow that to pieces. Um, there seems to be an effort to reconcile that. Again, are you hearing from the delegation on that? Do you have concern? Can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I've, I've spoken with several members of the General Assembly since the governor's speech Wednesday. Um, the speech was something of a rupture in, uh, in uh, the effort to be bipartisan. I mean, his inauguration speech was really nice and very bipartisan, and he said that he'll never make a decision on a partisan basis, so um, we hope that's true. Uh, but the speech Wednesday was a rupture in the relationships. But I, I know that, that everybody wants to get back on track because we want Maryland to succeed. We want the governor to succeed. If the governor succeeds, Maryland succeeds, and vice versa. So everybody wants to have a good relationship with the governor. But his speech Wednesday was not well received. If I can backtrack for a second on the uh, school superintendent, you said that uh, Dr. Stark decided to leave. My understanding is that the school board was unhappy with his performance and he didn't have the support to stay. At his news conference, he said he would like to have stayed. Um. You know, the decision was made that he would leave on February 16th. I mean, he would have been in the job uh, until June. Oh, you're referring to his early departure then? Um, as I understand it, you know, he could count the votes, and the votes were not there to renew his contract. And so he and the school board engaged in a negotiation on the terms of his departure. The school board hasn't said what they want in a next superintendent. Do you have, as a parent, what would you like to see? Or what qualities would you be looking for? I'm kind of reluctant to go there. I mean, um, I am also in touch with school board members. I, um, you know, I, I think that there is a strong desire uh, from the community to get, although the personnel process is going to be confidential and it needs to be. And if you look at what happened with Dr. Starr when he was flirting with the idea of going up to New York City, um, that got a lot of publicity and that probably wasn't helpful to him. 
you can understand why other candidates for the job would be very reluctant to have their interest in the job broadcast. And so, you know, much as I'm sorry for my friends in uh, journalism who would like to know every detail of the process and every potential candidate who's being vetted, that's not a good personnel practice. Hiring decisions should be made in confidence. Having said that, um, I think the board uh, is working to lay out some, some broad guidelines and principles uh, and communicate with the public about what its goals are for the school system at this time of, of um, transition. It uh, will come before the full council on March 2nd, and my prediction, March 3rd, thank you very much. It'll come before the full council on March 3rd, and I predict it will pass unanimously. You did have a hearing last week. The committee reported it on Thursday favorably. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a hearing the week before last. What's the word out of Rockville? Are they considering the same? I anticipate that the city of Rockville, I got, a, I got a message from the mayor of Rockville endorsing the bill. I've been in touch with uh, my colleague, uh, Rockville council member Julie Polakovich Carr, who intends to introduce legislation in Rockville consistent with what we do after we do it. And the reaction has been relatively favorable so far? So far. Overwhelmingly favorable. Um, there are pet store owners and one veterinarian who works for a pet store owner, and the pet store is her major customer, and they don't like the bill. Um, other than that, I would say the ratio of support versus opposition to the bill is about 97 percent to 3 percent. That, that's not a scientific estimate. You smiled as you brought up that bill. Yeah, Obviously, tell, yeah. me, tell me why this is important. I just think it's nice. It's touched me. I mean, I, um, I'm not a dog owner myself, and uh, it's, it's, uh, I own a bird. Um, it's just touched me. I mean, the stories, I mean, if you listen to the testimony, it was really touching. I mean, you had former employees of this pet store whose conscience was bothering them. And you had um, folks who have worked with animals who they saw being abused and they were weeping, you know. It, it, you can't help but be touched by this. And again, it's it just the one store in the city of Rockford that this would fall under, but not under the county's law. There are no stores that would fall under your Matt, you've got that right. Okay. Um, there have been stores in the past, okay. and um, there was testimony to that effect from a woman who ran a store that's no longer in operation. And I think that tells you something because I think the market is changing, and I think the market is headed towards um, the, the largest participants in the market um, are Petco and PetSmart, and they don't sell uh, dogs or cats from puppy mills, and they're enormously successful. They, they assist pet owners to fulfill their function. They sell equipment. They sell... Uh, pet food, they give information about adopting, and, and their business model is, is booming. To be clear, there's nobody selling kittens, though. Uh, I believe that's correct. Okay. Yeah, I believe that's correct. And back to the state of the state, one of the things that he mentioned was the so-called rain tax. Montgomery County had its water quality protection charge before that. Exactly. Do you anticipate if the governor is successful repealing that, the county will do anything? Um, so what I'm interested in with the rain tax is making sure that it's accurate and fair. And so we've heard from property owners who feel that in the initial round uh, of bills that went out, the estimates of impervious surfaces did not accurately reflect what was on the ground. And so um, I've actually been in touch with Chairman Berliner, and I'm hoping that we can look at implementation of the water quality protection fee um, to make sure that it's accurate and fair. But the need to raise revenue to capture runoff and make sure that harmful uh, chemicals and substances and pollutants don't make their way into the watersheds and into uh, Chesapeake Bay remains, and it's a federal mandate. So I don't, I don't see repeal of the water quality protection fee. Um, you, you know, over and over again, I keep hearing people saying, you're taxing the rain. We're not taxing the rain, and we're just not. So I, I don't see how a, a phrase gets into currency when it's not happening and we're not taxing the rain. Um, we're imposing a fee to pay for necessary improvements to make sure that we have excellent water quality, both locally uh, for our drinking water, for the Potomac River, and for Chesapeake Bay. And, um, and as I've said before, I mean, it's one of the most pro-business things we can do to maintain a healthy and thriving Chesapeake Bay. People want to come to Maryland for many reasons, but one of those reasons is we have delicious seafood. We're famous for our blue crabs and uh, rockfish, and we're trying to restore our oyster industry. So. You know, there's a, there's a strong business rationale for why you need to maintain a very healthy groundwater and stormwater runoff uh, system. And also, what about the highway user revenue? I know Montgomery County gets some of that, and the governor is proposing increasing the amount that goes to the counties. That obviously goes to road projects, not transit. 
what is the impact on that, and is the county pleased to be getting? Yeah, is Glenn Orland here? I thought I saw him. We, we did get those numbers. Steve, do you know those numbers of what we expect on highway user revenue? Yes, it's actually, for fiscal 16, it's a very small increase. It's $4 million for county statewide. $4 million for all counties statewide. $19 million for municipalities. <clears throat> I think what the governor plans to do over an eight-year period is to ramp it up. But in fiscal 16, the amounts are very small. But, you know, the challenge there, too, is if he were to succeed in his call for repealing the indexing of the gas tax, which he's not going to be successful and the legislature isn't going to pass, that would interfere with his promise to restore highway user revenue and build roads. Um, he's not going to be able to do those things if, if you didn't have the ongoing gas tax revenue. So I think those two pledges are in conflict with each other. On the rain tax, what does the county spend that money on? Because one of the complaints from Annapolis is that each county that charges this spends their money on different things. Um, you, you should speak to Director Felt at the Department of Environmental Protection, but in general, um, it's spent on a wide range of projects to capture runoff and protect water quality. Um, money is spent in um, stream beds to prevent erosion. Uh, money is spent in um, uh, rain gardens. Uh, we have a, a project that assists um, homeowners to install uh, water capture mechanisms, rain barrels and rain gardens. We also have um, rain gardens in our public projects. Uh, we're building complete streets in various parts of the county that do a better job of capturing stormwater runoff. We need to modernize uh, um, storm drains throughout the county. They're, they're old and outmoded. Um, so it's a wide range of issues that are directly connected to the federal mandate mm -hmm. under which we must operate to prevent erosion, prevent runoff of uh, uh, pollutants and um, and protect our groundwater, our drinking water, and the Potomac River and Chesapeake Bay. George, WSSC put out its budget recently, and it looks like rates are going to go up about 1% for people in Montgomery County, which compared to, you know, the 5, 6, 7, 8% increases we've seen in the past. What's your reaction to this, knowing that in part of how they did that, and I believe the council discussed this, was they're phasing in a fee increase so that your bill will have a more steady fee that you're paying but your rate increase will be a little less. In general, we have a huge infrastructure challenge. We've had water main breaks that are extremely disruptive and put people's lives and property at risk. So I, I think a steady long-term approach to restoring a reserve at WSSC to cope uh, both with a, um, uh, to, to expedite maintenance and replacement of water mains and to cope with these crises and emergencies when they happen um, you know, is probably called for. It, the, it'll be the T and E committee that will recommend to the full council, uh, you know, how how we should respond on the WSSC budget proposal. Is it good news though that at least for rates we're not seeing huge jumps we had in the past? Um, I'd like to give Roger Berliner a chance to answer that. I, I haven't delved into it yet. I'll look and see what the T and E committee sends us. I asked you about the measles vaccination last week, yep. and you said you were looking for some information from MCPS and wondering if you've heard from them. Yep. And what's the Board of Health update about tomorrow on the agenda? Yep. Um, so actually, the, the update from MCPS was not specific to measles, uh, but I can share, if my chief of staff will um, circulate, we got an, uh, a, a, a good letter from Superintendent Starr, very prompt, and I appreciate it, and we also got a good letter from our health officer, Dr. Tillman, and we can share both of those with the media uh, right away. Um, and so what Dr. Starr said is that um, w what gave rise to the, my communication with Dr. Starr was a case of rubella in an elementary school, and we had parents concerned about it and whether it related to non-vaccination. And um, we don't know the specifics of, you know, whether that specific rubella case was or was not the result of a specific student being vaccinated, and we're not really entitled to get into that level of medical detail about specifics. But um, basically, the vaccination policies in Montgomery County Public Schools are dictated by state law, and um, it was less than 1% of students who were not being vaccinated for religious or medical reasons. Um, and Dr. Tillman wrote us a letter that underscored those same statistics, and she'll present uh, those statistics. There has been one confirmed measles case in Montgomery County in the last few years, and it was in 2013. So she's not aware at this moment of any confirmed measles cases in Montgomery County, and she's going to present to us tomorrow. And just to be clear, because I've heard some people in this debate talk about having free access to these vaccinations, does the county's health programs provide those that can't afford it or can't get it free vaccination? 
That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'll ask Dr. Tillman that. Okay. Anything else? The OLO report tomorrow on alcohol. But yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you're going to tell us about that? What do you expect? Or? Um, I expect a robust discussion over the course of 2015 in the uh, special committee on liquor control that I've appointed, which is chaired by Councilmember Reamer and includes him and me and Councilmember Elrich. Um, uh, Councilmember Reamer is the special committee chair. Councilmember Elrich is the public safety committee chair, and I'm the health and human services committee chair. And um, the Office of Legislative Oversight will be staffing that committee. They've, uh, in an early round, they've identified a range of options from all-out privatization, which we would lose about $30 million a year in revenue, to improve customer service within the existing system, which shouldn't cost anything. And I'm not prepared to opine today on that range of options or what I prefer, because we're going to spend the next year going over the pros and cons of different approaches to liquor control. And then ultimately, what if we develop a consensus in county government, any changes to law would have to be done in the General Assembly. But the General Assembly, I think, would listen very carefully if the county achieves some sort of consensus. But the OLO report is just a factual overview of how the system works and different directions we might go and what those might cost. Is there a meeting scheduled for this task force? I think so. February 22nd is our first meeting. February 27th, sorry. Yeah. Any other questions? Always nice to see you all. I'm really appreciative of your showing up for these meetings. I, I never know who's going to be here. It's good to see you.